So, whenever you want to go, Tom, I'm, I'm, I'm framed up on air. I guess the first thing is, um, which uh, I've actually always wondered, is how you and Arya came together. How, how the thing actually was it? Did, was it wholly formed, or did it start as a reading and turn into something? Or uh, but it was fairly simple actually. Um, Arya knew my work, and I knew hers, but we'd actually never met. I had seen seen his work, one of his works. I've forgotten the title in the malt house that was then called Playbox. And I was in the audience and I didn't like the production, but I closed my eyes and I thought, my God, the text is fantastic. It's fantastic. So I went home and I wrote a letter to Daniel, who I didn't know from anybody, and said, look, can we, can we talk? So we had a meeting, had coffee. We said, oh yeah, why not? You know, we had no money, no, no plans of anything. But I, I had some short pieces that I'd written um, on spec. And he said, you can have all my work. Just here, have mm. all my work. And I was a bit overwhelmed by that because I didn't quite know what to do. But we just said, well, let's just start. And that's when we started to do, do the reading. I got the actors together. Robin Robertson and Dan Spielman and Greg Stone and Paul English. And, um, and we organised the reading at the VCA in the shed at the back. Um, just near the where the horses are in the police stables. So, and we, so we had a reading one evening, and just with invited people, and um, and it was it was the main thing about it. It was just a real hoot. I just fell in love with his his words, his text, his um, the, um, the darkness in it, but also his passion and his love for uh, humanity. Mm. And um, I was in that point, I was probably, you know, we just, it worked. Then it was a question of space because we had no, no funding. So we went around, all around Melbourne looking for a free space. We went to all various councils, went to theatres, we went to all sorts of places. And eventually we ended up with the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. I wrote letters to, one of them, to the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. I don't know, I mean... I can't think back how I had the guts to do that, but <laughs> and she answered. She was the uh, a kind of publicity person for the Brothers of St Lawrence because they're very much into the science of being poor. I mean, how would he say people are poor? Mm. You know, and, and do the research. What causes it, or what causes mm. it, and how people? Can, you know, they're not just giving money. They mm. really want to want to research. Mm. And she was very interested in that. And, and the bishop said that that we could have the, the storage room at the back of the op shop in Brunswick Street um, for nothing. So that was perfect because we didn't have anything. So <laughs> we took that and. Um, and then we just mounted our first season. But the funny thing was, of course, in the, it was full of furniture, this warehouse, that they would give away once a month to anybody who needed a bed or a couch or a chair or a kitchen table. Or people would just come, I think it was on the first Wednesday of each, each month, and they could take anything they liked. And they would come in and they would pick, like in the shop mm. there. And, but, so that was the only time we couldn't be in the warehouse. And I decided right in the beginning, we only use the furniture in the warehouse. We don't bring things in. Mm. Uh, we don't bring a setting. We mm. work in that smell, because mm. the mattresses were pretty pony. I remember, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and in that time, in that time, I very much came to up, appreciate that, to actually like, make theatre with without all those finicky um, uh, kind, of, kind of rules of mm. actors and stage mm. managers mm -hmm. and theatre, like uh, all the things that have to be there. You put a little dot where you stand and a square where the table is and the chair is just there. <laughs> you know, all this kind of crap. Um, and I, it was such a, such a wonderful thing to tell the actors, they are creating the work. It's nothing to do with which chair you sit on or what costume you have on. It, it, is, it is 
it comes from you and in between you. And so we were all getting very interested in that, that it had nothing, that the space around us could change. Mm. Um, and amazing things happened. There was, a, I guess, a kind of a, a sense, at least from the outside of the company, that there was a, a very strong political aesthetic at work. Mm. In, in, um, w w of which that whole being in the Brotherhood and the set being yeah. necessarily different and stuff was, was, was a really, seemed to be a very integral part. Yeah, in as much as the plays themselves are politically charged, I mean the texts themselves are politically charged and I knew that they were and I wrote them because I, you know, because that was part of the, part of the reason to write them. But, but when we started working, I mean Ariette and I, I don't think ever once talked about the political content in the whole five years we worked together, we never once had a discussion about what this meant politically or what the plays meant politically. It just, but with actors I talked about it, but it was something that, that in a strange way we sort of just assumed. Like it, perhaps because it was so obvious that these plays were about these characters in these situations being performed in this place. Um, it just all fitted together like a jigsaw puzzle and in, in, in a funny way there was no reason to talk about it. It was just so clear that that's what it was. I'm totally against issue theatre. Mm -hmm. I hate it. I hate sitting in the audience and being uh, taught talk to, mm, you know, mm. like this is preach that. And uh, preach that, that's yeah. what that no, no, I I never saw King Taylor like that. It's, and and Daniel didn't either. He found that kind of way of writing about those people because these people they, they live in high drama situation. Mm. In, in you know, to actually live on the street is is like living in a war zone. Mm. And it was the high drama but we both found very, very interesting. You know, mm. everything is heightened, you mm. know, mm. if you live on the street or when you picked up as a young boy by the police and you don't know what you've done wrong. And, mm. and I mean, there's a, you know, very uh, undomestic uh, situations and, and that was the interest. Uh, you know, these kinds of characters deserve a place on Australian stages. Mm. I mean, why aren't these people's stories being told on our stages? People who are homeless, people who are unemployed, people who are sick, people who are crazy. You know, like, why, why when I go to the theatre, nine times out of ten, I'm watching middle class characters on stage? Yeah. I, I mean, that's fine, but but where's everyone else? Yeah. Um, yes. When I think back to '97 and that that period, obviously we were in a quite a different political era mm. that we're in now. Um, do you think how how much do you think that was at the time and influenced the kind of the Howard government? The oh, it was because I was depressed for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Howard government actually depressed me for 10 years. And it was only when it was finally gone that I realised, oh my, thank Christ that's over, you know. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and it was a big thing that, you know, it was, again, it's not a vert in the plays or anything, but I think that um, the whole relaxed and comfortable business, mm -hmm. you know, which was, was something that just made me so angry. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and the plays are kind of a reaction to that. I'm, you know, like saying, what about these people? They're not relaxed or comfortable. I mean, what are we going to do about them? Or don't they exist? Or... This country is so bloody comfortable. The mm. people who go to the theatre are the most comfortable of all. You know, and I don't think it works to start preaching. Uh, no. I, mm. um, I think you do, in the I, you do need in the theatre to, to move people to... Uh, excite them, to make them laugh, to, to move them, to, to give them, to make the actors so human that they, that you just want, want to cry looking at them, mm. you know. I think people were looking for something like that at all, because we were very surprised that, um, you know, when we began, when Ariette and I began working, we had no ambition, you know, we just wanted to do, in, at the beginning it was these three or four plays, We'd just do them together in a program, and um, but you know we couldn't. It, people were queued up around the block. I mean, yeah, it, it yeah. was just we were really surprised. I mean, we thought, yeah, we'll get some people along, and um, but the reaction to it was incredibly it was overpowering, and um, so that's why we just kept going because it seemed to be people wanted to see this. You know? I had this extraordinary opportunity where we had a pool of actors that were really enthusiastic about the way, and there were some wonderful actors. Mm -hmm. These were actors I'd been dying to work with for years, and there they all were in the room, you know, Malcolm Robinson, 
Paul English and Helen Morrison. Like, you're going, oh my God, you know. So I had this opportunity when we decided to keep going, the actors were still enthusiastic about it because at first there was no, one, no money and people were doing it just for the love of it, really. Um, I had this incredible opportunity where I could write for individual actors. So I wrote Untitled Monologue for Dan Spielman because he was a young guy, he was incredibly talented. I thought, you know, I'd love to write something for him. And I had the chance to write for him. And I, I knew that I could have, you know, Malcolm and Greg do Night of All Two Men. And, I mean, it's an incredible gift for writing to know you have these extraordinary actors and you can write things for them. Um, so as far as, I mean, it improved, I mean, my writing just suddenly went, because I had my own laboratory kind of, and I tried all these things and, and I mean, I, I abandoned more plays than I, than I actually finished, but, but the ones I didn't abandon, I could immediately hear them read by the actors, which I think is an extraordinary yeah. thing for a writer, or it's a must for a writer, you must hear the play. Um, and then it would be performed and, and I'd watch something like, you know, getting shelter or something and go, oh, that gives me an idea for, I can do something else with that idea. Or, mm -hmm. so, um, so yes, the work changed, the work developed in all sorts of unexpected ways. And also there was Ariette's influence in um, what she wanted the theatre to be. Mm -hmm. um, Oddly enough, Daniel and I never have had those conversations. We've mm. never had this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, he might also have been influenced how I did things mm. because mm. I, I went in often into kind of surrealistic, mm. um, unrealistic. Because in theatre you can do anything, and especially mm. if you don't have to have a set design and stuff like that. You you can then pretend anything. Categorising people's writing particularly to their face is a very <laughs> dangerous thing to do but I'm going to be throw out a fairly lazy term and mm. say that um, I, I would categorise a lot of the, the Keen Taylor project writing as social realist. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know if you would agree or disagree with that. It's a broad term. I don't know. I think realist, it's certainly not naturalistic. I mean some people have said that it's that and I would disagree that it's naturalistic. The plays, or the best of the plays I think um, combine a kind of social realism where it's very obvious that oh, this is a guy living on the street or this is a single mother or, you know, it's very recognisable and, and, we, and we can place it, you know. Um, but then I hope what the players do is take that kind of simple, recognisable, almost cliched kind of situation or image or person and then crawl under its skin a little bit and you sort of maybe see, maybe reveal what you don't necessarily see normally or what you didn't, the, didn't the interior. Yeah, the interior yeah. of it. And I think that's where um, the language, the language is the thing that does that, that shapes that. I mean, if you had a, have a really close look at the plays, people don't actually talk like that. No, no, absolutely, yeah. But, but there, yeah. there is a, there, hopefully I'm able to fool, um, if that's the right word, to fool the audience into thinking that they're hearing ordinary, like, everyday language or quotidian language. But it actually isn't. It's really highly structured language yeah. um, that has the appearance of everyday language. How much did you and the ensemble of actors um, influence what was being written? And by that I mean, like, uh, so, like, did, did did the text ever change in rehearsal, or, uh, um, or? Did, did, did Daniel ever come in to rehearsal and kind of go, look, that's not really working, I'll, I'll no. redraw that? Or... No. I felt we were working with Daniel's text, and that's what we were working with. So there was not such a thing of... That was, that was the core of the work, and we just had to make it work. Mm. And we had to find different ways of doing it. And I would come in with outrageous ideas, um, but sometimes really, 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 really worked. And, yeah, we, we, we worked with that text, but we could do it in any way. We could sing it, we could dance it, we could, you know, there was no holding back on how we would do it. Um, but there was never a discussion from, this is a bit long, we should cut this. Mm -hmm. or, but, or whatever, or ask them to change it because it doesn't work for the character. So I just wondered about whether you feel that did, did, did you feel that it, that it was a natural end for it? Did you feel like that was the right time to step away? To no, let it when go? it happened, it felt like two legs were amputated. Mm -hmm. I was, it was so painful and so upsetting, and and it was horrible. And and we both 
Daniel and me, we both had an equal part in that. Mm. Um, but I think it had a natural life, and it seemed to me that we'd come to the end of it mm. um, before we started to, as I say, like ossify into something um, that was expected, and we just had to, we would have had to somehow reinvent ourselves, you know. Um, I had a lot of mixed feelings about it because it wasn't easy to sort of say that, well, I think we're done. Um, where people were going, like at that by that by that stage, you know, we were we were getting people were throwing money at us. We could have done things, but um, but that wasn't the point, you know. That I just thought we'd reached the end of something, and <coughs> like the end of anything, there was a, there was a certain amount of grieving in it, but also a kind of relief. Mm -hmm.